Hello, welcome to the CG Pro podcast. This is episode 47. We have Felix Jorge with us today. I'll do a quick introduction to him in just a second. But if you enjoy today's session, you can follow us at becomecgpro.com or in our free Facebook group. So, yeah, here we are. Felix, welcome. Great to have you here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having you me. You bet. So uh, Felix is uh, many things. He's a good friend of mine. He and I worked together on Jungle Book and have, have been known each other since then. Felix has gone on to do some amazing things since then, starting Happy Mushroom, and which was a, a and is still through Narwhal Studios, its new name, uh, an amazing creative studio. They were responsible for a lot of the incredible environments in the Mandalorian and Book of Boba Fett and projects of that nature. Um, so <clears throat> I will leave it there and, and say, Felix, welcome. It's great to have you on the podcast, finally. Thank you. We finally got Thank you on. We've been trying to do this for a little bit. I appreciate yeah. it. And uh, yeah, it's nice to be here. I think uh, you're doing some cool stuff, Ed. And I'm happy to do a class with you right now. It's pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. We're we're very fortunate to be able to be working together again in a different capacity. We're we're now doing a a course with Noel uh, in world building, which has just begun, and uh, yeah, it's, it's going great. So I'm very happy about that too. And we met on Jungle Book. How many years ago? I don't even know. Um, I've had children since then to dissolve yeah. my <laughs> my brain. Um, 2015, something yeah. around there. Mm -hmm. At the time, I was the VAD supervisor. You were lead engineer, which is... I don't know what I was on that movie. On I yeah. read characters. <laughs> I made pipeline tools. That's it right. Like an empty warehouse, and we showed up and tried to figure out how to make a movie. <laughs> I did a lot of stuff. Ended up in the VAD, though. That, um, is right. that is right. That's when I met you, at least. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I've done a, a bunch of other things before that. Um, but yeah, so uh, today I would love to ask you a little bit about you and about your your journey to this point, because now you're a, an entrepreneur and an executive at Arctic 7, and you've gone through building Happy Mushroom into Narwhal. And, um, but you, you before doing all of that, I know that you worked on a lot of other movies and where did, where did this all <clears throat> begin for you? What did, did you have some early inspirations, some things that made you want to get into film? Was it, was it a conscious choice? Was there like a, a one movie or some, yeah. some inspiration that led to this? You know, funny enough, what got me to movies were games. I'm, I'm a huge gamer. I got into this industry, like I was raised in Puerto Rico and I used to play games all the time. And uh, I remember getting Game Informer magazine back when magazines were a thing. And we, uh, every time there was a page that said, come to Full Sail, this is University of Florida where you can go and get computer animation. And that was the, the beginning of that adventure. I, that, I used to draw Dragon Ball Z. I used to play games. Eventually, I went to college for computer animation, went to Hollywood and did, uh, went to Noman as well and did some additional courses to polish my skills. At the time, I was working at a furniture place and going to school at Noman, which is pretty, uh, pretty tasking, but that's what you do at that age. And uh, eventually, I started working on the History Channel. Uh, on modern marvels and like small shows like that as a modeler just like modeling ships and I modeled ships for about a year and ultimately got, uh, I called a friend of mine or, or hit up a friend of mine and he was working at the third floor and that was like my big first chance. And I worked on, uh, the first project I worked on, on there was a game actually. It was, uh, right. uh, Tiberian Wars, Command and Conquer. And then from there I just did oh, cool. a bunch of movies for like eight years with the third floor and so on. <laughs> so that's that was the beginning, right? The third floor, and yeah, that's so cool. Long I, long I love the the Command and Conquer series. Oh my god, me too. That Red Alert cool. and all those. Yeah, that style of game was awesome. Funny story. That was my first. To me, it felt like my first big job, right? It was like, oh my god, you know, I'm working on History Channel, and these kind of things. Which are, I also love modern Marvel. Uh, I love all the shows from History Channel. 
right? I haven't seen it in a long time, but uh, when I worked on that, it was my first, the first thing I was extremely excited about. I played the Command and Conquers and I posted it on LinkedIn. And someone grabbed my LinkedIn, like a fanboy, and announced it. And I had the EA lawyers come into uh, come into the third floor, and they pulled me in. And <laughs> so I yeah. ended up Command and Conquer, which is kind of funny. <laughs> That's a good story. <laughs> so it was games, games originally that got you into. Did you want to work in the games industry, or was like the, or did film just kind of? come you along know, and get your attention more. I always wanted to work in the games industry, but film is so fascinating and it pulled my attention and I worked in game in, in film, you know, for so long because I really loved it. I, I, I was lucky enough to be an environment artist that worked on the stage, like on the set on wizard of Oz, there were 200 extras. It's, it's one of my examples, right? On wizard of Oz, there was, a, there's a scene, the newer one that Sam Raimi directed, there's a scene where there's, 200 extras and then the balloon blows up and they all like react and i was the guy pressing the button right <laughs> it's like building the set helping build the sets with brian pace and other members of the third floor and then also seeing that experience of production reacting to the sets and reacting to all of that was just so such a lucky thing for me to be a part of so a lot of my experience I mean, most of my experience has just been working directly with the directors, production designers, DPs, really just helping create sets or environments in my earlier age. And then as I evolved to where I'm at now, that's a lot of what I nurtured through Happy Mushroom and Narwhal. How do I empower them even further? That's what I was really into. And what what was the what was the kind of breakthrough moment for you? You know, you kind of mentioned it briefly there but what was that that kind of breakthrough moment for you what what do you feel like because a lot of our listeners are already in the industry a lot of them aren't and they're all people are always curious about how how do you break in because there's no rule book to that really you know there are multiple ways in and it's changed over time but what what do you feel like was the thing that uh that really got you in in the first place well i think creatives have a unique opportunity to see see things and 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 i'm talking to the creative audience i guess right now which is like a little bit harder to see ourselves running businesses or maybe see ourselves uh doing some of these things that aren't creative right but while i was working at the, at the third floor i saw that previs was using a process that could benefit from game engines and at the time, they weren't using game engines. And all my friends were at Naughty Dog, at Blizzard, right? They're all at these game engine studios. And I would look at what they're doing, and I would learn from them, and I would go, why can't I use this in film? And so because I was an environment artist working on film, instead of working with the director primarily, which is what visualization is for, I was working with the production designers and the DPs, the cinematographers. And every time I talk to them about previs and about the worlds, they always complain about it not looking pretty enough or things having to be thorough away uh, or, or, or things have changing in post. And those are the three things that motivated me to create Happy Mushroom. Visualization that was running on a game engine that ultimately satisfied what I saw in the industry around the brain of a production designer and a DP. So I knew that I wanted to solve that first. And secondly, because I'm a production person, I wanted to create a process that really just empowered those key creatives at the beginning. So, but uh, there's definitely a moment I worked at the third floor for a long time. And then eight and a half, eight years in, I go to Jungle Book, right? M meet you. That was the first time I put a team together of like, it, I think it was a team of like 12 people that we had. Uh, they gave me the opportunity to go and source that team. And uh, that was like my first preview at looking at a team that was game engine and also production heavy. And so we used Unity on that project. And after that project, I knew how to use game engines. Like officially, I had jumped into game engines. I knew how to use Unity. I did a project with you guys on it. I knew how to work with the teams. 
and that's I was looking out there. No one was using Unity or game engines for previous at the time. Um, we were like that I can remember. Maybe Avatar was at the time, but no one was seen it. And so that motivated me to move to Big Bear for a year and figure out how to do previs out of Unity and Unreal. And that's really how it started. But to take it back to connecting dots, it all came from the fact that I was on the box and I saw people and I saw, oh, there's a concern here that isn't getting answered. And it's over and over. My, you know, we're going to have to fix things in post. Uh, creatives in pre-production saying that previous worlds and cameras are throwaway because the production designer isn't there or the DP, so they're going to change it. Uh, the way that I would say that you transition over towards the next step is finding the gap and then coming up with a solution for that, for that concern or that question that people have. So initially, what, what got you into um, being a great previous artist? <clears throat> what, what kind of skills were really important to you um, early on? I think that single and, and I hire for the same skill. <laughs> I think the skill that most places are looking for is a person that's willing to learn and able to learn and goes out of his their way to learn, right? And so obviously when you're starting off especially there are a lot of uh areas that you don't understand <laughs> and there's a a lot of things happening that you might feel like you have the answer, but uh, I think that the, the biggest thing that got me here is just my willingness to continue learning. Even when I had a full-time job, I was trying to look into things and, and improve even my craft on a daily basis. And, I, and that now translates to another level, right? Now I'm at a different level. I'm an executive at two companies, but I'm still constantly now tapping into my creative team and asking them what is there to learn. And I'm tapping into my tech team and my operations team, and my, my HR team. And so I think uh, there's so many skills to learn and you can't really learn them all, right? But if you're willing to continue learning, I think that's the first step. That's, that's the, and if you're able to verbalize that in, a, in an interview, they're going to hire you because <laughs> that's what they want to know that if I hire you, uh, you're going to be able to take this on because you're learning, not because you're expecting me to just teach you everything, but because you are actually going to teach me something because you're learning, you're the professional, you're going to learn more than me about what you do. And so I think that's, uh, that's what I hire for all the time. So how do you, how do you how do you kind of pick that out of say someone comes to you you've you've got a a job ad out there um, looking for somebody in the in the VAD let's say what um, what are you going to be looking for from them because they know that in visual effects you, and um, many of the CG industries you're looking for a, a showreel and showing evidence that, visual evidence that somebody can do something. Um, then and now you're also talking about the the soft skills as well, which are really important. And I'm, I feel the same way about those two. Um, definitely, you can teach a skill, but there are certain personal qualities that are much harder to impress mm -hmm. on somebody if they don't have them already. And having that um, is def definitely important. Um, what? How do you? How do you? find them in people if you haven't worked with them already yeah how do you, how do you pick that out yeah that's a good question you know obviously it starts with the visual portfolio and when i'm gauging portfolios i'm looking at how much experience do you have uh, what kind of position are you applying for uh, based on that then you look at the portfolio and see if it measures to the same you know what you're what you're looking for but what I'm looking for is typically the portfolio itself, a resume or something that says what you've done. Maybe it's on LinkedIn or IMDb, right? And then it's the conversation. Like, uh, uh, are you someone that is going to share some of your ideas around what you're working on? Are you someone that uh, um, taught yourself something without having to go to college? 
Are you someone that, so I'm always listening for these things that show me that you as an individual are going to be able to continue learning. And it's not that I'm, I'm never expecting that you know everything and it, you know there's a lot of things to learn on the job as well, but uh, I'm always listening for that. Like, is there something that you learned on your own, right? Do you have tools to unblock yourself? Do you know how to YouTube? Do you know how to Google? And that sounds silly, right? It really used to be on my, I remember that when that was on my resume as a skill, listed as a skill, yeah, as, <laughs> being good at Googling. But, but I mean, it is, it is, it is something that, uh, that is, uh, I definitely take into consideration when I'm looking at things. What, what kinds of things do you like to see on, on reels? for this type of work what what kinds of things would you recommend people put on them we get this question a lot at the school that what, what do people want to see on a reel yeah well i think people want to see it's a tricky question what what do people want to see uh, let me you know when people ask these kind of questions i ask i typically ask what do you want to do there's work out there Right. It, there's a bunch of different kinds of world building jobs. Uh, so ultimately, I want to see the kind of work that I am hiring for. So like if you're trying to get into a company, look at their portfolio, look at the kind of work that they could create and try to uh, tailor your portfolio to the places you want to go to. Right. And you don't need to have a lot of places that you're targeting. You can have one and then you really work hard to get that one, but then you can send it to a bunch of places. Right. But definitely identifying what that is or identifying if I was going to answer this differently, identifying what you love and going for it for that one thing. Right. If you like games, if you like movies, oh, I like the style of, you know, I like fantasy. I, I like sci-fi. I, I love fantasy and sci-fi. So you'll see that I have a lot of fantasy and sci-fi <laughs> in my portfolio. That's by design. And so I would say that it, strengthen the areas that you have fun in and you will find the kind of work that you do. And you'll find the studios that also are looking at those kind of people. Because there's a lot of work out there. It's just, um, I find that there's more opportunities than ever to make things easier for all of us, the creatives, for all of the people that I'm working with, but it is harder to focus. It's harder to, because everything's so easy, I find that there's a lot of people trying to do too much and trying to satisfy too many other people instead of looking inwards and going, okay, but what am I going to like to do for the next 10 years? And then really putting time into finding what that is and then just doing it everything else will come with it. Like you'll find the studios, you find the people that are as passionate as you about it. You'll find the, your community. And uh, if you're constantly trying to chase the job, you will have a harder time because then you're allowing the industry to tell you what to do. And that's, you, you, you're not everyone can find the motivation that way to continue to the point where they're doing something extraordinary. Right, where, 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 yep. where you feel super proud of it. But if you are really into it and it's something you love, you're most likely going to produce something that's really good. That's a really important point, I think you make there about <clears throat> making something extraordinary. That, that That's really, and, and what you're clarifying from what I hear is that if you're not passionate about it, if it's not something you love, that you're unlikely to step past the hurdles. There's just, challenging moments in making this stuff and to step past those uh it takes takes that passion to when you want to stay up until midnight uh, mm -hmm. to get something finished and but you do have to make something that is outstanding that mm -hmm. literally that literally stands out from the crowd because you are in some cases in a crowd and you're trying to get somebody to to see to you in up. that crowd yeah to pick it up you know yeah. there's there's a lot of work though. So I tend to think extraordinary and even getting picked out really comes down to you, 
to you? Because I think most people fail at the at the interview, <laughs> mm. not at the portfolio part. Uh, so you're supposed to be the one that feels like you did something extraordinary. And I love hearing that story. How did you get there? Because ultimately, to get to something where you feel like it's extraordinary, it's typically not just going through the class, because the class is going to give you the tools, but then you got to you build what you want for your own psyche or for, for, to satisfy your own hunger. And so I think that's a lot of the that's a lot of the hard hardships that people have now. So many options, so many options, so many people telling me what to do. But what do I do? You know, and it's kind of like do what you love. But there's so many things I love because everything's easier. <laughs> so right. it really is a hurdle. It's 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 a struggle for for many of us, right? Like so many things that I can do too. This the a lot of things are changing. Yeah, I'm the same. I almost want to do everything. And I was told early on not to try and do everything. <laughs> But I wanted to be a generalist, and I, I knew this. I think uh, something I was able to accomplish in commercials early on, and I know being in previews a little bit as well. Um, but now in in virtual production, it seems like this is really important to to be a generalist. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, uh, being a it's like everyone is a generalist, but they're also specialists. <laughs> you know, it's, you kind of have to be good at something. And uh, everyone has something that they're good at. And those that are truly fully generalists, that are either really good at many things, but pretty good at almost everything, which is just as valuable, are good at management or are good at like, breaking like memorization right because it's like to be able to be good at so many things so there's 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 areas there that i often look at almost differently where i go okay well yeah you can't light as good as this person or you can't make build the, the the final pixel set or you can't you know you don't have that that ex what people perceive as the high value skill necessarily but there is high value in being that generalist that could do everything and then also communicating that you're not going to be the person that's going to take it to the final pixel. Right. And you're the person that's going to help put the plan together. That's going to help figure out the film. That's going to help. And so, so yeah, I think I, got, I went on a little tangent. I can't remember exactly what the question no, was. It's, it's, it's good. I think it's something that's really important that doesn't get talked about as much as some of the, the soft skills and talking about communication. Now, I've seen a lot of people in the industry um, who are very capable of producing great work uh, get to a point where they kind of melt down even when they're, while they're on a job. And often it's because of not communicating up the chain the, the fact that they're having a problem or that they maybe can't do a thing. And people often don't, um, it seems like in, in a culture today that we have this sense that you shouldn't show that you're bad at something uh, or that you can't do something. And for or that me, you're it's... afraid or that you're nervous. Right. right. There's a culture of not being vulnerable. And I, right. I agree with that. That's. But as a leader in the industry, you want that. You want people to, to be real with you. You want people mm -hmm. to be honest with you and tell as producers want this, leads want this, supervisors want this. They want someone to be real with you. Um, any any like uh, thoughts on how how you can be that way? Because I know a lot of people are scared of doing that, of saying that they can't do something. If they're scared that they might lose their job or yeah, no, it's, they might it's be... a real fear. One of the things that I tell everyone is, how do you know if you don't ask? Just just ask. The worst that's going to happen is they're going to tell you no. Then you're going to have to go back and sit down about sit down and think about it again. And then maybe approach it a different way or go do something else, right? But the I think uh, really the thing that I've had to work on the most is patience. And it's mm -hmm. uh, in active listening and in as much as possible not giving my own opinions because ultimately it's 
especially when you're starting off in your career, we have a lot we want to share. And so uh, the problem is that there's a lot of things that we don't know. And so what tends to happen is if you're practice deep listening and you just keep it to questions and you ask questions, you have a better chance of providing an answer. And so that's my first approach that I would recommend. It really is just uh, uh, ask more questions, try not to give your opinion because opinions could come off arrogant if it doesn't have the full context. Mm. And uh, that's the first exercise. Ask for, you know, ask. The worst thing that you could get is a rejection. Ask more questions. Don't give your opinion. So. Questions is, yeah, the great, the great uh, piece of advice. If you could simplify it to one concept, to ask great questions. Yeah, ask more and more questions. And when you're, as you become, as you learn more about a person, you'll ask better questions. And those questions will answer questions. <laughs> so, so you you answer questions with questions. And and it actually, when I think uh, what's ha- allowed me to work with my business partners for so long, you know, I work with my best friend. We've known each other since college. I work with someone I've known for over a decade, uh, or at my other friend, my other business partner I've known for over a decade, uh, is the fact that even amongst each other we are always asking each other's question. It's like, but why do you think this happened? Even if we feel like we know the answer, right? And so even at the highest ranking level, that is the skill set that we're applying. And then it's the same thing that I suggest to my team, right? Or, or, or creative teams, because I think what made me, uh, uh, what got me where I got here was that I used to ask everyone around me, what do you do? Why are you here? (laughs) Storyboard artist. Why are you here? (laughs) You know, Uh, director. One time I was in 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 the elevator with Sam Raimi. And uh, I was like, hey, Sam, I'm Felix. What do you think about Previs? (laughs) You know, (laughs) it's like, you know, you know, it's just uh, curiosity is 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 a great thing for knowledge. And ultimately, I think what it helped me in my career is that I'm pretty knowledgeable of what people do and when and why. So when I enter a room, if I hear a role, I know off, I know typically what their challenges are, generally what they're trying to get, uh, why have they been invited into the room, right? And so all that came from questions to people. You learn about their process, et cetera. I'm sure now everybody wants to know what did Sam say? Sam, we got cut off. He just, the elevator opened. He's like, oh, you know, I don't have time for this. But I did, we did spend many weekends with him after that. So that was part of it. Uh, But I actually don't, we, I remember when that elevator opened up, he was like, yeah, I got to go. And then we spent multiple weekends working with him. And he actually does really love Previs. And, but yeah, I don't remember exactly. I only remember me being nosy. (laughs) <laughs> well curious maybe is another, yeah. another word for it i think is where great things come from you know creativity really comes from curiosity and asking questions what about if we did this like this or what about if we put these together and like yeah, yeah and you find you know what you're going to do with people that are like i don't want you about be bothered you're going to find those people too but ultimately it is about finding your community and your community is going to humor you. Your community is going to see it in you. Right. And why go after the guys that aren't going to support you in your growth? Right. If, if don't, don't, don't pay any mind to them. If they're busy, that's okay. You say hello, you move on. But those that do give you the time, then you have a relationship. You could take them to lunch. You could, that's one of the things that I think, a lot of people uh, can do that I don't see enough of. Ask your boss for lunch. Ask whoever you feel admi- that you admire to lunch. Tell them, I'd love to take you to lunch and just pick your brain. And uh, it's amazing how that both can help you 
if you go with three questions and don't try to, you know, just go with three questions that you've thought about a lot, but also how flattering that could be for a person. Ultimately, we're all working, 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 but the moment someone says, hey, you have something and I feel like it's cool, they're probably going to give you the time. I agree. Yeah, I mean, um, that probably, uh, I'm sure, happens to you now, it, the other way around. So I, I think it's great, great advice. It's like that uh, Pitbull song. I'm not uh, exactly a huge Pitbull fan, but there's one one of his lyrics where he says, uh, ask ask for money and you'll get advice. Ask for advice and you get money twice. I, I like I like that quote. Instead of uh, instead of asking for a job, ask for someone's advice on how to get a job. You know, there's a really interesting thing with that quote, right? Why is it that it gets your job? Well, maybe one of the reasons is because now they know your interest, and they yep. didn't feel like you were trying to go after them for their money, or right. for their job, or for their, you know. Also, they are giving you advice, so they probably understand you and can, and when they need you they could probably source you because they know what you want to learn and it goes back to that growth right if you talk you start talking to these people you ask for advice now they know that you're a learner that you're curious that is you ask good questions you ask good questions especially if they give advice and you follow through on any of it like it doesn't have to be the whole thing i mean a good example is after Command and Conquer, I worked on Alice in Wonderland. On Alice in Wonderland, the production designer was Andrew Jones. Andrew Jones was my production designer in Jungle Book, where I was a bad supervisor. My first chance, big chance. Andrew Jones was the production designer in that Sam Raimi movie. Right. Uh, which was Wizard of Oz. Andrew Jones, production designer on The Mandalorian, gave our Happy Mushroom the biggest deal and the biggest chance we ever had. Right? So... And Andrew Jones was my first target. He was my first job, my first production designer, and I asked him everything, right? I was just like, okay, but what does this person do? Why did you hire them? What does this person do? And ultimately, he gave me all of my biggest opportunities as I continued in my life. And uh, so did all the, so many other ones like him, like uh, gave me opportunities. And all of them are people that I was curious with took out to lunch, made friendships. And then from those same people, they, once I, a, born, a company was born, they also brought me into the room was like, come on in. Let's, uh, you know, you want to learn these things? Let's, let's teach you some of this. Cause at the time I wanted to be a manager. I didn't have a team. I wanted games. So once I did have the team and once then they let me in, they, they helped me achieve some of the stuff that we wanted. Go buy Felix lunch, people. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> I said, go buy, go buy Felix lunch. People. Yeah, <laughs> go buy yeah. anyone you admire lunch. They're gonna love it. So, since you you've mentioned it, no, we're talking about the business side of things, you've you've created Happy Mushroom, had some big success, worked on some very cool projects, pivoted to uh, well, name wise to Narwhal Studios. And then, and now um, in that executive and, and leadership position, which you, you interesting that you mentioned it um, being less creative. Although I feel like everything is creative in some sense when you're you're making something new, you're making something new. The tools may not be a paintbrush, but uh, you're onto a new a new creative uh, it really adventure. Is. I agree. You know, I think. Uh... I uh, have this conversation with a lot of friends, and actually, I think a lot of people identify with this. Um, I used to. The fear of, like, getting away from the art. The fear of, like, and I'll be the first one to admit that I suffered of imposter syndrome for years. And I still get it, but I, I, I think that's a, that's a, that's <laughs> a perpetual thing that I'm working on. But, uh, you know, I, my, my business partners, they're brilliant. In my eyes, they're brilliant, and I, you know, I think they're really smart. And Andrew Mack, he's an incredible uh, engineer now, works for us as our CTO and CEO. But Safari is also an incredible lighter and just talented, talented artist, world builder. 
And so I worked, always worked in previs. And then all of a sudden I had this finals person who I'm teaching previs and it was, I had imposter syndrome and it took me a long time to find how to use my creative in an executive way or in a way that's like, Oh, I can be creative in the way that I manage. Yep. I could be creative in creating a proposal to get this job. I could be creative in finding the kind of work that I want. I could. And so now what I'm really into is helping creative succeed, right? It's I'm someone that was able to go from an artist to manager, to owning a company, to selling the company, to now owning two companies. Right? And so ultimately I think, uh, a lot of that came from thinking creatively and from tapping into my community and going, you know what? I can live through your art because I want to now promote you so that you can succeed. And that's, that's what, that's what got me really excited. That's what gets me really excited through my job. I'm, I'm creating, I'm constantly, it's really, interesting to think about business now in a creative well in a creative way and even finance right and even operations so it's uh it's pretty cool and i really do think when i say things that uh, i've been saying to people that i see creatives as the people that could pretty much do everything and that's why it's up to you to find your focus it really is one of those things where as creatives we have an ability to create pretty much anything, <laughs> even jobs for ourselves, <laughs> even other people will create jobs for us, for us. Right. And so, um, that's what I do now. I create jobs that don't exist or I empower jobs that do exist. Or I, and, and that's a lot of where the creativity comes from. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're, what you're up to now, whatever you're yeah. allowed to say. Sure. So, I am a chief communications officer at Arctic seven long way of saying that I help them with their marketing. I basically sit with their different studios. They have three game companies and now Narwhal studios joined them as well as a virtual production branch. And so I work with all the studios in helping them get out there to the world, but I'm also building the virtual production pipeline within the company. So I help cross the different companies. And so, Narwhal Studios has a team of nine people, nine to 12 people. And so, but those nine people and 12 people, we have seen projects where a team of nine can send work to a team of 50, right? So we were, we've never had that kind of structure. And so now at this company, we're able to have a structure where we have a small unit. And then because that uh, Arctic 7 has other companies that we're working with, I have a backup team of 150 employees that can do a lot of the, the sets in the back end. But so long story short, we have, I have a, a little thing at Arctic seven, which is our virtual production company. And I'm helping them build their multimedia organization. because we want to do games, film TV. Uh, and then I also am doing education and courses, which I'm really into. They've been my favorite thing to do lately with you, Ed, and I hope we continue doing those. And then I'm also, uh, we have some uh, virtual production tools that we're going to start announcing and launching here soon to the public, which were the tools that we created and that we worked on throughout the seven seasons with Lucasfilms and all these different projects that we were on. So that's probably the one I'm most excited about because uh, I learned a lot in the past couple of years. We were... We had a hundred plus employees at Narwhal Studios and we shrank down uh, last year. And so when we had a hundred projects, we can only really do around six at a time. And so we did a lot of projects or seemingly a lot of projects, but I think I'm really into democratizing process. And as I started thinking about it more and more, that's not a, the right way to scale the process because ultimately it only allows me to do six projects at a time. What I'm excited about with you and with what we're doing now is that the Narwhal tools and the education are going to allow us to help hundreds of projects at once 
in the near future. And that means that the tools already were built with the largest projects that have done in-camera VFX and virtual production yet, right? So those tools are solid. And instead of them just staying in Hollywood, now they could be shared globally. So that's really what I want to uh, achieve in my next couple of years. It's really to give this process to everyone worldwide, not just not just here in the West Coast. I'm I resonate with that a lot. Being having been running a school for the last few years and and essentially on the same mission to get what we were worked on together and mm-hmm. some of those movies uh, out out to more people and to help lift the uh, the industry and people. There's a lot of individual creators as well as people trying to make big budget movies. There's lots exactly. of exactly. It's never been easier. <clears throat> to have this in your home. Yeah. Never has been easier. It really hasn't. What sucks is that the knowledge isn't out there and it's not out there because the studios that are doing the work are the ones that have the knowledge, right? And 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 Epic is trying to get it and CG Pro is trying to get it. And you know, there's a thankfully CG Pro has you. You actually did it, Ed, right? So there's that. But the what I find is that it's a combination of education and tools. Epic's putting some tools out there. We're seeing a lot of things go out. We want to offer a version of that that also does the same thing in a different world, which is make creatives' lives easier, make it easier for them to create the final product. So I think uh, I think we're doing some good damage. At the end of the day, it, it's getting easier than ever, and more people are using it. And hopefully in the next two to five years, we'll see other countries be able to produce the quality of work that we produce, which is, I'm not saying that there's not talent that can produce it, but I, it's a production thing. It, it's a, it's a, it takes a village. And I think that village is what needs to be tighter. Yeah, I agree. So. <clears throat> My producer is reminding me that we have <clears throat> some questions in the chat here. So we can bring a couple of those up. Um, so uh somebody's asking how were you able to work on star wars haha <laughs> what did you do for mandalorian and upcoming ashoka yeah good question so on the mandalorian you know it's all about relationships like going back to asking those people for lunch but i i did have an experience at that point many years of working in, in world building and working on films in pre-production. So by the time I got to The Mandalorian, we I had already worked for eight years in visualization. Uh, four years, I had created Happy Mushroom and we were four years in. So we were already, we had made three games and we had worked on multiple uh, films. But to make it onto a project like The Mandalorian, like we 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 secured the job so like we had a full virtual art department but the people that i was hiring for them to make it if that's the perspective that you're looking at from uh, as a as an artist it was you know at the time i don't think that people really knew how to apply for it it wasn't a thing uh, it was really me finding people on art station and uh looking on social media and seeing what people were posting so be seen Make yourself be seen. Uh, as an artist, as artist, I mean, I'm. I love my job because artists don't like to get themselves out there. We don't. We, we don't. It, it's weird to your face yeah. on camera. Even this call, I was bef- right before it. I was like nervous because it's always bizarre doing that. But it, I think the answer is put yourself out there, and then. What we did on the on, on the Mandalorian on the Mandalorian, it really started Mandalorian season one, and then we did seven several seasons with Lucasfilms. Uh, on the Mandalorian season one, it really started as a proof of concept with me and Safari, where we were hired to grab a process that was like Lion Kings and Jungle Books, where they used the virtual camera and they use all that technology, but they wanted it to be adopted towards a photorealistic look out of Unreal. 
Safari being the creative lighting genius that he is, focused on, uh, we had a proof of concept, he focused on the look, uh, making assets look the same in Unreal that were photoreal, and also rendering them in V-Ray so that there was an understanding of how those two assets could go from one to the other. And then I was responsible for building the pipeline uh, in pre-production for the production designer, the virtual production supervisor, the director, and the DP. And so uh, within the first two and a half, three months, Safari and I had created a proof of concept. We brought everyone into a meeting. Uh, we gave a pitch, a presentation. Again, if you're passionate, that was two people that did that, right? It doesn't take a lot of people to land the whole job. We did that presentation and we landed the whole job. Next thing you know, I'm hiring 20 people. Amazing. So, and then from there, you know, you be humble, do a good job on the job, <laughs> uh, ask more questions so that you know what's the next stage of things. And uh, we then follow to, from there, we really worked hard to figure out a system to, uh, uh, I, I did the first Mandalorian and then I stepped out to the company and, and to take care of the company because at that point we were growing and Safari stayed as the VAD supervisor and did met several other seasons and had even had multiple art directors under him at one point. So uh, that was, uh, that's kind of how it happened. It snowballed after the Mandalorian season one, it kind of snowballed from there. We were already on attraction, but of course, the Mandalorian came out and that was after that we worked on Ant-Man and a bunch of other stuff. I love the, your comparison there to the, how similar it was in business, in the business sense to how it is in the individual sense. Like I sometimes will say the same thing to people like, how do you, how do you succeed in any venture for me? Or will say it's, this is a Peter Drucker quote. Uh, it's innovation and marketing in business. You've got to come up with a great product and you've got to get it in front of people. And, as a person, you're doing exactly the same thing. So every, everybody is in marketing, every, is. whether you like it or not. You're yeah. either doing well at it or you're not doing not well at it and sharing your work. If you're using your social media for fun, you're wasting your time. Use it for work. Mm. You can still have fun with it, but use Hopefully it as your portfolio. Everyone, the industry is different now. When we were coming up in the industry, LinkedIn wasn't there. We DVDs. had to apply to the jobs that were available. <laughs> Mailing DVDs to people. Yeah. Oh, God. Horrible. The stack of DVDs at, after, after. <laughs> oh Making God. a really pretty, so pretty label for the DVD. Oh, my God. Yes. You would print the labels right yeah. before you go to the event. You're like trying to tape them on. Trying to and do, like wrinkling them. And and run out. Out. Yeah. Ruining a whole stack but of DVDs. But now you have LinkedIn. So. Yeah. There's an equivalent of this where instead of asking me to lunch in person, you could ask someone online to just have a conversation and to help you understand how to get in. And you could hit almost everyone up. Anyone. Of course, um, there's a technique to that. You probably want to like yeah. a lot of their stuff and then say really small hello. You know, and if you're interested in that, we can talk about that. But marketing, as gross as it makes people feel, is the most essential part of all of our job of all of, of everything we do and you we've all seen people out there that are better or worse than us do way way better than us just because they post more yeah right? and so so powerful it's just the way it is it's the way the world works now and, and 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 you know what it's a benefit to us the people because all of a sudden you have access directly to those people that you didn't before. And it may seem overwhelming, but if you're able to turn off the noise and focus on you and, and in your portfolio, we have more opportunity to arrive. Like you don't have to just work at a place throughout your whole career to get there. You can actually build it yourself. That's great advice. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. <clears throat> it's, it's so true. You now we, we had a, an example, somebody recently who I challenge everybody who leads the course what the courses that we do to share immediately share your certificate share your project you know put it out there you will even especially if you feel nervous about it and I, I have a little challenge to myself that i try and do something that makes me feel nervous every day because th that's where the growth is that's mm -hmm. like the, the little thing that you gotta 
push past. We all feel it. Felix mm -hmm. just said it, you know, coming in, even, I, I get it every single time I do one of these two. I, I get yeah. the same thing. Absolutely. It doesn't go away. <laughs> but uh, but pushing past that, that's where the magic is. When you share, you inspire people, you, you let people know what you do and what you're interested in and what you want. It's really... And again, it's important to note that the people around you aren't the people that you're trying to get to hire you. Yeah. The people around you, unless they're helping you and motivating you, and if they're telling you something negative, if they're telling you something negative, they don't matter. If they're giving you critiques that aren't, you're doing great, keep going, straight constructive criticism, put them on the side, mom, dad, I love you. <laughs> I need people that are gonna give me constructive criticism, not just like I love everything and also I don't like something. What What's beautiful about social media now is that you can find, it's a global market. There's billions of people. You're going to find people that are gonna give you some feedback if you look for it. And that's the people you wanna to gravitate to. Just lean to the people that are gonna help you grow. And never before we had that opportunity like social media. People that can give you critiques that can, and people care. It's amazing yep. how much they They're surprisingly, care surprisingly accessible too. Yes, and accessible. It's so, be okay with rejections. If you go out and you're like, oh, they didn't get back to me, try again, try someone else, post to somewhere else. Because there is someone like you and there's a lot more people than just one like you. There's hundreds of people like every one of us. We just gotta find them. That's great, great advice, yeah. Being being okay with rejection, persistence is key, right? It's mm -hmm. being persistent. I, I, work, I was lucky enough to go work at ILM. <clears throat> I think I was rejected from there six or seven times before that last Yeah, uh, you try again. Yes, uh -huh. yeah, just keep trying. Keep trying and try keep again. improving, more importantly. Keep asking yeah. questions, keep improving. I would every say day. try again, but don't do the same thing twice, right? No. It's like, yeah, that's right. hey, I tried, let me go work for a month, a month and a half, try again. But but give people something to look at and maybe self, it's not about self-promotion, right? I think, and, and this is where maybe most, it makes people gross. When you look online, I did this, I looked, I did that. Keep that to 10% of what you do, of what you post. If you feel like you feel comfortable, 5%. Be factual, just say what you do. Like if I'm reading something, I don't need to hear that you're excited. I'm the one that's supposed to be excited <laughs> about your work, right? Uh, it's fine if you say you're excited, but what I'm saying is it's not about promotion. And the more we move away from promotion, the more it's made me want to be a marketing person because then it's about straight up talking about my team and what they're good at and what they're doing, exactly what they're doing. I'm off, you know, I've been trying to refrain from saying I'm excited. I'm trying to refrain because ultimately... I want to post something that even my artist is excited about. And maybe my artist doesn't feel as excited about saying that they're excited. They just want to say, look at this cool thing that I did. Uh, tell me what you think. Right. And that's if, if we approach it that way, maybe it's a little easier to engage. I lost your camera. Uh, yeah. It's <laughs> coming back. This is a, live studio fun happening in real time <laughs> it's fast you're back cool well uh oh, there it goes again all right i'm um, looking at some questions out here yeah we've got we've got a bunch to get through so if you're now let me jump can... in i'm gonna see them real quick what type of cameras and lenses are you using for virtual production all of them so we replicate any of the cameras from the director of photography in unreal engine and we set them up in a way where they can use it so that the cinema so the cinematographers they really drive what kind of lenses and so on the mandalorian for example uh uh the dp the director of photography who also shot dune greg frazier he made a custom lens for that move for that show and i think he does custom lenses for most of what he does and we actually had to use the mathematical uh, factors to recreate it in Unreal. So you could use, you could recreate pretty much any of the lenses. And if you don't know, if it doesn't exist, you could put the exact mathematical parameters and you can. 
Uh, that one you answered you? already. You, that, that was the Mandalorian Star Wars question. Um, got my camera working again. <laughs> so uh, somebody says, uh, why the company name change? And did the original come from the Mellow Mushroom near the Full Sail campus? <laughs> I don't know what the mellow mushroom is, but I love it. I love it. Uh, you know, we decided we want to go a different path and uh, we ended up at Narwhal Studios. Ultimately, Happy Mushroom was something that served us really well for a long time. But uh, we had a collective decision between the studio heads that because of some of the circumstances that we wanted to move away from that name. And who knows in the future, Maybe you'll see the happy mushroom again, but we're uh, we're working through Narwhal at the moment. Love it. You can see it right above here if you're watching on the video. <laughs> I'm looking at the, um, the next question. Oh, if you're going to read it, yeah. step back. I can read it to you if you like. Um, what, what would be your recommendation for people transitioning while coming in from other industries, like advertising, film production, um, to identify and join an open-minded team in cinema, active in virtual production. So, yeah. So skills are transferable. This is one of my favorite topics, by the way, because I think uh, virtual production is very accessible for other industries. And right now I'm looking at film, TV, and games, but I often think about it in architecture, in broadcast, in, uh, in uh, you know, for vehicles and for, for design. I think that because skills are transferable, I think regardless of what industry you're in, and because you can get a little virtual production hub at home, you could just jump in and figure out how you would use it. And you can make an offering. What is making an offering or making a solution? That's the thing you're selling. That's the, and, and maybe the offering is me as an artist doing great work. Maybe the offering is, hey, I am in broadcast and I now use Unreal to design all those sets and it actually makes it easier for you, the person I'm working with, to know what you're doing. But I would say that uh, transferable, the skills are transferable and uh, if you're someone that wants to get into the industry, the tools have never been so accessible as they are now. So why not download them? try them out and go from there. Great advice. Yeah, there's no barriers, really. I mean, you need a computer of some sort. Um, and think about, you know, think about what problem you're trying to solve. Ultimately, maybe the problem is that you yourself want to enter that, that space. You know, it's like, well, I have a problem with the fact that I don't like my job. <laughs> I want to fix that. Maybe the problem is that my boss has a problem with this. Like he keeps complaining about a step in the process or like I have a good idea that I want to show that person or, and then answer it through virtual production. The, yeah. Great answer. I, I was in that, that position. I came from another industry. I was a software engineer before I got into visual effects 16 years ago. And I, I had that problem. I didn't like doing what I was doing. I was experimenting, dabbling, you know, books and DVDs. And I realized that was going very slow. So I went and did some education. Now, same as, as Felix here. And I, I did some education. It was a three month intensive, much like what we do at CG Pro. And after that, you know, it took me a couple months to polish the reel, get some material, share it with the right people, do some networking. So it's all the same principles just now we're, we're on online and not in DVD land. Yeah, I, uh, after I left the third floor, I didn't quite have a grasp on Unreal in Unity yet. We did Jungle Book. I had a little bit of a grasp, but I actually took a year off after break just to jump into Unreal and learn it. And I did little jobs throughout that year, but I moved out to the mountains and, and I learned everything on YouTube. I learned how to build the company on YouTube. I was a 100% artist. I had no idea what a company was <laughs> other than I worked for it. Uh, but I learned everything on YouTube pretty much outside of building an environment. Everything else was on YouTube. 
someone's kind of echoing this point, not sure if it's a question, but saying the first step in seems to be the toughest without any IMDb cinema references, etc. even with 25 plus years of production experience and the boldest eagerness to learn new skills. I, w I would say I got one thing I'll say, I'll ask you as well, Felix. I, I had I was in the same position. I had zero hours. That my first job, they asked for two years professional experience minimum. I had zero mid seconds of product professional experience and project work on my reel. That was it. My first boss said, "I didn't know what to do with you. You like nothing on your reel." And he said, "If I saw something in it, and I tried to do a couple of things to." Some of the things that Felix said, try and stand out. I had some stuff in there from my VJ career because it was in quirky and interesting. And that was weirdly what's, what poked out uh, and showed you know some difference there. But I had nothing at the beginning at, at all. And uh, I don't think not, you necessarily need it. It's not about popping out, though, right? Sometimes it's about consistency. Uh, posting consistently at certain times. The biggest success that I have found has been when I put together a campaign. Like, think about the president. It's like, oh, he's running for election, and he goes to the different states, and he says hello. And, you know, it's like building ourselves a campaign for yourself. And you go, okay, this campaign is going to be me posting something every month for six months, one thing, or every week if, you're, if it's possible. Because I think the problem comes – down to other people not knowing what you can do other people not understanding your value and it doesn't have to be through virtual production there's different ways to show value and uh that's all of our challenge right if if if, if you yourself want to make the change it is your obligation to do that if you want to your company to do a change then is there obligation you could work at the company they could do that for you but to to be perceived as what you want to be perceived, it, it's it's it takes work and it takes telling people what you do. Consistency, I think, was the the magic takeaway there as well. And it doesn't stop once you've got that first opportunity. Keep keep going because once you're in, then it's like you're you're thinking wow, this thing happened to me that I was dreaming of since I was a kid or whatever. But then you're in, and then immediately you celebrate that for about five seconds and then immediately your sights are on okay what's the next thing um yeah being consistent putting stuff out there continuing to ask questions some great great advice um someone is saying can you tell us anything about the tools can you can you yet or are they you're waiting for the release well i had had an amazing presentation last week they're already built so there is that I am actually thinking about how to how to show them. Um, but sure, I'm, a lot of the tools that we've built, we have, I think the thing we're working on the most right now is how to relay the information and how to educate the community on the value and how to use them. But we built the tools over Ahsoka, The Mandalorian Season 1, 2, and 3, Boba Fett, Dust Bunny's, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Ant-Man, Black Adam, and so what they do is a multitude of tools, things that you would do in normal life production. So like as a DP, they can place a camera in the Unreal, that camera shot will go up to the web, will show the producers what it is, you can draw over it, mm -hmm. give notes, it goes back into Unreal seamlessly. Uh, there's tools that are for the production designer to be able to critique the worlds. Um, to be able to know where the LED screen is, to know what kind of shoot method they're going to use. Is it an LED or is it going to be uh, something that's on location or is it going to be something that is um, at a stage? And so it basically makes it really easy for them to visualize all those things. But ultimately, it is very focused on helping those decision makers at the beginning, the producer, the, the production designer, the DP, and the director to have visibility so that instead of ha them having to immediately go to a visualization team and have them do the, the previs, they themselves could do a lot of that work with, v with VR and or with an Xbox controller or with, and then from there they can decide what goes to the next stages um, and they could budget it out, right? Way early on. So it's very focused on that. 
thanks for sharing about that. Um, yeah, looking forward to seeing more about that. What uh, someone's asking? What are the toughest roles to find talent for? Interesting one. Very great question. First of all, part of what's hard with these roles is that people don't know that they can even apply for them because they're called something like VAD supervisor or VAD set decorator or, and really a lot of those roles um, can be fulfilled by many different roles. So, um, but when it comes mm -hmm. to the roles that we find the hardest roles, it's the art directors um, tend to be the hardest ones and or the positions in leadership, because since it's not such a new, it's kind of a new art virtual production. And I think people are still very focused on the tech, but it actually virtual production can be very hard to manage because you're giving everyone a tool where they can do things live all at the same time. <laughs> There's a lot of things that could break, a lot of tech that could break, a lot of uh, emotions that can surface because there's also <laughs> do you have any you tools and, for that you know you're a creator yeah <laughs> tone that down. That, let's tone that emotion down um <laughs> but uh it's uh the the hardest roles are the art directors uh, tend to be pretty difficult because they need to have a mixture of filmmaking but also game technology and so there's a uh, obviously the hybrid is is pretty hard to find Awesome. Um, so what skills, less social, more hard soft slash software based, uh, should we learn outside of the courses offered to make us more attractive to studios or to shorten workflow? You know, I don't know if there's software you could learn that really makes you attractive to studios because there's so many different ones. Use the one that's going to make the world that you're making look best. Right, like that's more the more the imagery that it comes out of it that makes you attractive. Yeah, so that, but there's I guess common like Unreal Engine's obviously the one everyone's using at the moment. So that's absolutely. But you know what? If you know how to use Unity, and you make something at the quality of Unreal, they'll hire you at Unreal at Unreal yeah. Studio, right? True. Uh, yeah. If you know how to use a game engine, you pretty much know the foundation of all of them. If you know how to work in VFX, if you know how to use V-Ray or Arnold or Mental Ray, they all use rays. <laughs> you know, it, you also know how to use some of the stuff I ray, right? They, they all use rays. So it's again, it goes back to what do you want to do? What do right. you want to be known for? Uh, what are the things that you love out there that when you watch it, you're like, man, that's awesome. Maybe that's what you want to be known for. I think getting an understanding and that is more important great answer um and you're learning fundamentals too i would say <clears throat> so it's more, more important than the tool because we used unity as you said on those movies now it's all unreal um we had to make that switch what sticks is the the core the key fundamentals are of the science underneath it the raw cg what's going on filmmaking leadership you know what? Let me let me give you a, a more pointed answer for that too. Maya, Unreal Engine, Substance Painter, Houdini, um, Marmoset. Uh, <laughs> uh, if you know some V-Ray, great plus. Get into uh, learning how to optimize your assets because if they can't run, and uh, ultimately from there, make it look pretty. But there's a bunch of other apps out there, software you could use, but really if you have a foundation on those, even at least know one of them really well or two of them really well, you, you're in a good place. Uh, another question, can I call you later for some specific recommendations and some questions I have? Well, <laughs> <laughs> That's a ballsy question, I like it. <laughs> Tear him up on LinkedIn, offer him some digital lunch. Um, <laughs> Sorry to answer that one for you. What is that? Um, <laughs> Hit me up a little bit. <laughs> there you go. There you have it. Yeah. Uh, is the right answer. Any advice on how to structure a reel or when to consider it good enough to send for specific arenas like previs or lighting or vehicle animation, et cetera? Well, you're only going to be as good as you where you're at, right? So I would say send it out at where it's at and then send it again a month later once it's better. 
and then send it again a month later once it's better again but the exercise and post it not just send it post yep. it socially post the progress as you're working on it like as you're working on it keep posting oh yeah look i i, I tested a car shader over here i tested that like post consistently send it in often because you're only going to be as good as you are, you are at that moment. And someone, you're not the one curating that, like the people that you're sending it to. So let them make the decision of when you're ready and you just keep trying. And if you can get, and if you get advice based on where you're at, then that's a win. Like what, what's the expression? Um, perfect is the the enemy of of done or whatever it is like basically you can obsess over it being perfect and never get it out there but it's it's more important that it's out there if it's not good enough people tell you and that's invaluable like back back you'll in the day never we're sending... be, you'll never be as good as someone that is actually putting stuff out there because it's not because you're not good enough it's because that other person knows what people want to see yeah and it's and that's always the the challenge of being an artist. It's I'm putting myself out there and giving you my creative genius or I'm putting myself out there, but also I need to put something out there that you want to see because I'm looking for that validation for the job. So um, putting it out there just gives you more eyeballs to tell you what did, did work and what didn't work. And what did work is just as important because when you hear that something did work from a, a reliable source, that might be that's someone that you're trying to get hired by or and they go hey this is really good that might be something that you can lean on and make better because because that's that's just as valuable there's gold here i hope everyone is picking this up so this is really real great advice um lots of questions coming in they're multiplying now uh let's try and get through them so um uh, I'm a filmmaker in Puerto Rico. As Felix is going to love that immediately. You got to hit me up. I'll see you there. Work, you you working, working on a film set in the 30s in Old San Juan, participated in the event organized by CG Pro at View Studios during NAB. We don't have an LED wall in Puerto Rico. So we are looking to use Unreal Engine with green screen with Vive trackers. This is a long question. What tools can you suggest to do a proof of concept to shoot our actors using current buildings modified via old historical black and white photos from Raul Rios Diaz hmm. so you're using Unreal all right so I'm going to go off of the first part so ultimately the way that we've used Unreal and this is where if you're using if you're if you're doing a traditional comp, you're going to want to get layers. So I would try to lean into a traditional VFX pipeline. Look at how a traditional VFX pipeline does it and try to replicate it in Unreal. Unreal might already have, uh, back when we were doing it, they, they didn't have documentation necessarily, but they not the best. I think they've improved that quite a bit. But my approach with what you're saying i can't remember the full question is how it is but my approach with, with what i heard would be first of all using unreal as a tool to design your shots like it could be great you put the camera down you make your environment you look at the shots and then through the shot through the camera you decide what else to do <laughs> make sure your actors represented make sure the world if there's a real life building or a fake building whatever it is it's all represented that's step number one. Don't make it look pretty at that point. If it's pretty, it's pretty, but don't, it's, that's not the point. Get as much information that you need through a lens where you then can answer all the questions that you just, just posed for yourself. Because that's what Unreal is best for. You have a tool where you can put the camera, you could see the lighting, you could see a block out or an environment or something back there. You said you had something black and white. You could make those buildings in Unreal as block outs, put them back there. And then before you even render anything, it's like the first step. You look through and you plan it. You go, okay, well, the actor's going to be here. I need something here. I need something here. What are the steps involved to finish that? And so the reason I say that is because there isn't one solution fits all. There is, within even green screen, multiple different ways to do things. And that's what I see as the challenge here. It's finding 
what are the methods that you want to use on your project? You already ruled out LED screens. Are you ruling out in, on location? Are you ruling out um, in a back lot? It sounds like you have a green screen, so you're ruling that one in. So I think doing that work with Unreal, where you're trying to find the, the, all your hero shots in Unreal at a very low quality, and then from there, deciding how to actually move forward with it. That's great advice. Yeah, I'm basically previous, you can previous anything, anything. regardless of Even whether you have LED Even or not. Even if it's all real. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You previous it, you can, you can get like uh, preview comps through Unreal on mm -hmm. set, whether you end up sending it through VFX. LED walls get all the attention. They get all the spotlight shone on them, but there's tons of, the tons of what virtual production represents that doesn't involve that at all. Um, yeah, great answer. Um, how are you handling new client acquisition? Is it word of mouth after Mandalorian? Can you repeat that? How are you handling new client acquisition? <laughs> There's a marketing question, I guess. That's fine. Um, is it what just word of mouth after the success of the Mandalorian? You know, absolutely not. It takes a lot of work, I think. Again, it's about being seen and people knowing what you do. There was a, a period of time where the Mandalorian carried, floated everything, but ultimately there are a lot of people trying to do this now. And the, the way that I would say that uh, we do custom acquisition is by educating people on what we're really good at and trying not to focus on what other people are. It's really about, uh, finding our own thing, finding what we have fun with, and uh, then trying to be the best at that, and then posting consistently, showing people, hey, this is what, what I do. Here's a piece that we did. This is the process of doing it. And explaining to people, where do they fit? If you're going after someone, where do that person fit in your process? And how is it that you're gonna help them? Great answer. Um, we, I think we've got time for one more question. We've got a few more, but maybe we can jump back into social media and answer them at some point. But uh, we'll take one more because we've gone, gone long today. But uh, last question, what is the usefulness of doing short films with virtual production for portfolios, small projects, and short films? So I guess, what is the usefulness of doing short films with virtual production? So when I think of short films, I think of the possibility of it becoming a full film or TV show or a game. Um, well, again, it's never been, you know, it's never been this easy to use these engines, but I think that there's a very unique opportunity with this current state of things, which is that you can pitch an idea pretty easily. You can pitch something that looks pretty amazing pretty easily thanks to this. So I think uh, when it comes to short films, the same process that I shared is the same process I would use on a short film. I would stage everything very low res, look through the cameras, identify the process to get them to the quality that you want. And uh, I, and does that answer the question? And can you pose that one again? I just want to make sure that I'm not going off track here. I guess the question was essentially, what is the usefulness of doing short films with virtual production? Gotcha. Um, well, there's different versions of virtual production. So there is virtual production pre-production, where it's just for designing something. There's virtual production on the stage, where you could do in-camera VFX. There's virtual production in mocap. <laughs> so ultimately, depending on the project that you have, you can use it in a multitude of ways and you don't have to use them all but i'm pretty sure one of them is going to help you with and and i think the one that i would lean on for sure can help is using it in in developing the story and the storyboards then from there I, you'll find other ways other approaches it was uh, like Real-time rendering always gets the, the hot spot, but for me, it's the real-time collaboration that's the most interesting part of what we're doing in virtual production, being able to iterate quickly and get through those ideas. Getting approval faster. You know, when, when as an artist, 
the thing that takes the longest isn't creating you creating the work it's getting people to approve the work (laughs) and uh and uh when you have a tradi- the traditional workflow just really painful for me a turntable and then one piece at a time and then you review with different people separately typically and it's just now with virtual production you get six people in the same room they have their own game system where they can move through the world independently from you looking at different things at the same time the amount of things that you can get through, the amount of decisions and the synchronicity of the team is amazing. It's so, it's gratifying. Uh, it's fun, right? You, you, you get to see people actually engaged. And when people are engaged and they're having fun, they approve your stuff. It, it helps you move through a lot of the bureaucracy of, 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 a, of a film and of, a a large studio system right so everybody ends up enjoying it more right like the the creatives enjoy it more because they feel like they have more agency Mm -hmm. in the process you you enjoy it more because you're closer to the creative process it's at least at least the creatives that are willing to to put it out there that way right i think what it does what it does do though is it gives you a process similar to what it was before virtual production before even vfx where If you had a script, you're going to call your three best friends. If you're a director and you're like, okay, I need to call my three best friends, production designer, DP, producer, let's go to Joshua Tree. I have a script that's going to be in Joshua Tree, and I want to go out there. I'm going to rent a place, and let's talk about it for the weekend. We kind of lost that. You know, it's like all of a sudden now with virtual production, that's kind of how it feels. Everyone sits in the set in the desert, in the Mandalorian desert, or in the Ant-Man alien planet, and they have a conversation and it's not about it's not about the tech it's about the story it's about how to portray the story that we have and then as a part of that you move the mountain so that the sunshine comes and hits them in the side and gives them the the feeling of being menacing (laughs) right but uh that's the part my favorite part of the job it's the aha moment when people go oh my god i'm just making a movie it's like like traditional work I'm not trying to learn what a texture map means. <laughs> I'm not trying to learn. I'm just going to tell you, talk about the shot and you have the ability to move things. And I have the ability to look at things on my own. I don't have to wait for you to move anything or, or I can just look at things. And that whole, everyone can just look at things is amazing. It's six times the information than we had before. I used to have to drive a screen and it was just one screen. And then I had 10 people behind me telling me what to do. Now they all drive their own screen. And I just get to be the orchestrator of the meeting. I get to tell them, uh, help facilitate, help them get what they want. Not them yelling at, at the person at the front in the hot seat trying to, and then you're just one person that's driving, right? No, they are all in the driver's seat. Now you are in the driver's seat as a creative. And I'm here to facilitate. And I think that's that's one of the biggest differences in the process and why it's it's uh, I, I still haven't seen a lot of people use it, but I think it's powerful. I'm with you. Yeah. And that was a great quote to close on. I think that it's not about the tech. It's about the story. It Let is about the story the lead. It's especially about the story now that the tech is easiest. Right. For a while there, the tech was hard. The effects yeah. were hard. It took a long time. And so you had to come in, you had to conform to the tech. Not anymore. Yeah, it's, the doors are opening. They've yeah. been blown off. Um, yeah, thank you, Felix. I um, I just love for, to ask you if uh, you have anything else that you want to share with your, with our audience. Any places people can follow you? Anything anything else you want to spotlight? Feel free to follow my LinkedIn. And uh, thank you. Hit me up if you want. That's it. Well, thank, thanks so much for being with us here today and being on the podcast and sharing all your wisdom and experience. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited as well, putting my CG Pro hat on uh, to be working with you guys at Narwhal and doing the, our world building course at the moment, which is going great. Um, very excited about that. I'm enjoying it. And uh, we're looking forward to our next round already, even though we're not finished with this round, but we have another round. If anyone is interested in, in studying with our two two groups together, 
um, we have one in in July. So let us know if you are interested. But um, Felix, thank you very much. I'll make an appearance in that one. Just let me know when. (laughs) All right. You heard it here, folks. Go sign up. I appreciate you, man. Thank you, everyone, for joining. I'll talk to you later. Thank you, Felix. And thanks thank you, buddy. Thanks to everybody out there as well. Thanks to our audience. Thank you, for Felix, for sticking around and going long and answering no, questions. Cool. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, everybody out there as well uh, for asking great questions. And you'll see us again in two weeks for another episode. Um, follow us at becomecgpro.com. And I hope you all have a great week. Go out there, share something on social media, share some work you did post something, feel uncomfortable and push through it. That's where the magic happens. That is, that is the truth. That is the truth. Thank you, everyone. Thank Thank you all.